It's an honor to be here today. And I think in addition to my day job, uh, we should mention that I am also a board member, proud one of the Pacific Council, and really glad to see the, the council reaching out to a preeminent American uh, international NGO, CARE, uh, to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic, the crisis in developing countries. Uh, we have two wonderful speakers today, uh, the first of which will be Michelle Nunn, who is the president and CEO of CARE. Uh, she was previously the, the uh, CEO of the Points of Light Foundation uh, and indeed a, a candidate for U.S. Senate for the state of Georgia. Uh, so knows both the humanitarian and the political side of things, which I know will be of interest to our, our audience. She's accompanied by Tatiana Bertolucci, who is the regional director uh, for CARE in Latin America. Uh, has eight years with CARE, has worked uh, in, in Brazil and throughout Latin America, and, and specializes on development and humanitarian affairs uh, in, in, in that continent. Um, so very happy to have you here today. And um, the, one second. Um, Michelle, I wanted to start out with you. you. You recently wrote an article for Time Magazine, uh, noting five things that we should be doing in the fight uh, against coronavirus in low resource center, settings. Can you share those with us? Oh, I'm muted, thank you. First of all, a huge thanks um, to, uh, to the Pacific Council for your leadership and for the opportunity to be with you today. And Peter, um, really grateful for uh, your willingness to, to moderate. And I hope that along with this, you will, um, that you'll, you'll find ways of interweaving the extraordinary work that the Hilton Foundation is doing at this important time and, and sharing that as well. So we did uh, at CARE um, put forward a, uh, a, both a, a video and also uh, um, an, an op-ed that spoke to what are some of the things that we have to do to get ahead of what people are calling the sort of second wave, the next wave in low income countries and middle income countries. And um, quite simply, we use the, the way of five uh, points. One is bring on the basics. So uh, the basics of water and sanitation, which for many of us, we take for granted that we can go and wash our hands 10 times a day. And if you're living in a refugee camp uh, in Syria, you know, some of, the, of, of the, those interviewed said, we can't even wash our children uh, once a week, much less how do we have access to the basics of water and sanitation. So we do need to make sure that we are um, that we're bringing that forward and as part of CARE's responses in some instances literally water trucks that we're delivering in other instances hygiene kits for families and other kits in other instances it's um, it's basic provision of PPE for health infrastructure which brings me to the second point which is strengthening basic health infrastructure and so we know that in the U.S. we've been overwhelmed in certain uh, instances uh, around our, our health systems and so imagine what that might mean for, uh, again, for health systems that are already fragile and weak. So building and supporting those, we at CARE are doing a lot as it relates to, again, training, for instance. We were one of the first to pre-position supplies in health clinics in Gaza and to give training to the medical staff there, um, including those who are, for instance, cleaning sanitation workers about what do we need to do from a sanitation perspective. The third, which is not always so intuitive, is um, empowering women. Uh, you think about the fact that uh, that 70 to 90 percent of the caregivers, those people who are the nurses, the front lines of, uh, of community health, are women. Um, we've learned in our work in Ebola and Zika and others that they're often disproportionately impacted. Uh, and they also have a lot of the answers. So uh, we, we know that it's important that they be a part of the leadership infrastructure and, um, and really uh, often are disproportionately on the front lines, but not at the, at the leadership and decision-making tables. Um, combating misinformation is the fourth. And that is 
um, something that we see here in the US, but is something that we need to really work on around the world as well. And that means anything as basic as in Haiti, and maybe Tatiana can talk about this, we're using boom boxes and driving through neighborhoods to, uh, to, to working through radio, to social media, and translating into, for instance, local indigenous languages, the importance of what the facts are around the virus. And then I think finally is just a reminder that everybody has a capacity to make a difference here. America's humanitarian leadership is at stake. This is uh, the biggest crisis that we've faced perhaps since World War II. And it is the first time that America is not seen at the forefront of humanitarian leadership. And our individual citizens have the capacity to advocate and to lift up their voice and to offer their support to change that. That's, that's a very helpful framework, Michelle. Um, basics, health infrastructure, empowering women, combating misinformation, and raising our own voices. Uh, let me ask you a couple of questions about these. Um, the strengthening basic health infrastructure. I mean, everyone I think on this call knows that the US's response has been shaky. Uh, and, and we are a very prepared nation. Uh, take us through the situation in Africa, for example. Uh, what, what is the capacity to respond and how do you go about strengthening basic health infrastructure? Yeah, well, there's a great deal of variability, as you can imagine, around uh, basic health infrastructure. But I think, obviously, uh, America spends more on our health than any other nation and, um, and in some instances doesn't have a return on investment that's commensurate with that investment. So um, some, some, again, countries in Africa, as an example, um, those who have dealt with the Ebola epidemic have certain infrastructure and systems that have been put in place around basic community health that are advantageous. But from a sheer um, investment capacity for into basic health infrastructures, uh, much less uh, technological capacity. So if you think about the number of ventilators in some countries in which you have tens of millions of people, you can um, count on your fingers the number of ventilators that, are, uh, that have capacity. So we do need to think about, especially at this time, um, new, new, no, new approaches to thinking about how do we support and especially um, to bend the curve. And, and a big part of that, I think, starts with prevention as much as possible. I think it's why so many countries in the in the low in low income in Africa, middle income countries have taken very stringent uh, quarantine efforts to try and again to try and ensure that uh, that they can that, that they don't lead to collapsed health and infrastructure and systems. Mm -hmm. But I do think we have to do some of the, again, basics. How do we get water and sanitation into mm -hmm. hospitals and clinics where sometimes even that provision is not available? Uh, and then we do need to also think about how do we, how do we secure, again, if you think about instances of the ratio of doctors to population, mm -hmm. much lower in places in many countries in Africa. And so we need to be particularly, um, it's always important to safeguard health, but those are precious resources that will be mm -hmm. vital to the fight ahead. So ensuring that they have PPE. And then I think we do need to think about what are the global ways that we're responding to this um, in the same way that we're struggling in the US with our health systems that are so localized. And there are certainly mm -hmm. advantages to that. But it does call for a coordination across our nation. And the same thing is true across, across and around the world, which is that we have to have, um, for instance, the partnership of WHO and we have to have a global response that not only helps support local governments, but that also helps us figure out how to distribute uh, the, the kinds of provisions that are going to be necessary around the world. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you on the partnership for WHO, uh, key in this fight. Uh, there are a lot of actors in a public health response. Could you uh, sketch out for us kind of the division of labor that you see with a when you use the word we, what part is for care? What part is for national government? What part is for the UN system? Yeah. Well, and there's so many different dimensions to this, as you say. So 
um, at, at a basic, well, let's, let's start at the top. If you have a, a system that has leadership at a global level and you can surge resources, supplies, and infrastructure uh, around the world as they are required, um, and you start to also know and recognize that no community will be safe until all communities are safe. So in other words, you can't put out a fire in one community and think that it will be safe if there's one that's raging in the, in uh, even uh, again, around Around the world because those embers do have the will eventually create a conflagration somewhere else again we have to extinguish the fires around the world that's why it has to be at a global response mm -hmm. then you have and and by the way that in, involves also um, these kinds of, of, of coordinated efforts with uh, we you know our CDC but there are disease control centers now around the world they mm -hmm. need to be in communication and working together you then have uh, national governments and they have to invest um, in important revenue and resources into their health system higher than I think we will have seen before. Mm -hmm. And we are going to have to um, partner with them in engaging in those resources. There's all sorts of things that go along with that too around canceling debt surging support for them so that they can invest appropriately mm -hmm. uh, and then we need to where we can make sure that we're partnering again the the kind of science that is being developed around the world in the most important ways to the places that need um, that need that support so one thing that's energizing and exciting I talked to my colleagues in India they said you know there's a there are there are millions of scientists in India alone that are working on solutions for this so imagine all mm -hmm. of the global intellectual capacity of, of the health and science community being brought to deliver against this. But we do then have to think about the community infrastructure in mm -hmm. INGOs like CARE, uh, community health workers, local INGOs, and how are we working to build trust within communities to ready ourselves for the provision of vaccines, because it's not just the scientific discovery, it's the capacity for distributing it that mm -hmm. will be important. And how do we continue through those community efforts to ensure that we are um, keeping the uh, pandemic at bay in order for science and health systems to be able to catch up. So lots of players and all of that and a lot of coordination that needs to happen. Yeah, I, do, I think you, you outlined that very well. Um, look, I, I want to take a page from my, my youth when I was in my 30s and I was a field office director for Save the Children in West Africa and participated in a whole global effort to immunize children where People had realized that we had the technical know-how, we had the money, and we had the nominal political will to vaccinate, uh, to raise vaccination rates from 20% to 80%. But what was required was leadership and coordination and really belief that it could be done. Um, I would love to see, I'd love to hear your response about how do we get back into that playbook? and How do we nail this question uh, in the way that we nailed child immunization in the 80s and 90s? Well, I think you spoke to the political will and leadership, and I certainly think that we will have the, we will have the, um, the will to do it, whether we have the political leadership commensurate to uh, the opportunities and imperative for cooperation is another question. Uh, I think the, the potential insularity and national um, mm -hmm. sensibilities <clears throat> preclude a more global response, I think are a threat that we need to uh, determine, again, strong national leadership, but also collaborative leadership. I think that the US's absence of, of leadership um, at the global level is having a significant ramifications and that we, um, that we ultimately, that America has been a vital player and should be uh, in, the, in the building of that political will and leadership as mm -hmm. we go forward. So I think that ingredient has been missing to date. I hope that that will change in the months ahead uh, okay. as, we, as we move forward. And let's link that to your fifth point about individuals raising their hands, right? Um, you're speaking to an audience that is enthusiastically global, that is deliberately bipartisan, Democrat and Republican, uh, and that it, it believes strongly in citizen diplomacy. So imagine you have 70 folks on the call now and the wider 1300 membership of, of the Pacific Council, uh, and you wanted to encourage them to put their shoulders to it. What would you, what would you say they should do? 
Well, I think there's a very practical and important uh, advocacy uh, voice that needs to be lifted uh, in the coming days and weeks, um, which is legislation that will be before us immediately, which is to, uh, to ensure that we have a provision of $12 billion for, for uh, develop international affairs and international humanitarian aid. Um, and if you think about the trillions of dollars that have been spent, um, that is a, a very small proportion. We understand the importance of, uh, of, of dealing with this incredible crisis here at home where we have enormous, uh, enormous, um, well, it's an enormous crisis. And uh, I think that, that that kind of investment is both warranted and critical. And, uh, and it demands bipartisan leadership. And I think we have that, but it is, it is going to take um, people like those on the, that are a part of the Pacific Council lifting up their voices, telling their congressional members that they're actually for international aid at this moment, and that they recognize that this, that this virus shows our interdependence more than ever before. All right, fellow council members, you heard it here. We have our homework assignment. Uh, let, and I, I'll, I'll come back to you. I see some messages coming up or questions coming up in the chat. I'll come yeah, back to you. About just to put a, a, an exclamation point on that. If you want more information, the Care Action Network, if you Google Care Action Network or go to the Care site, you can learn more about how to specifically uh, reach out to your congressional members there. Super, super, excellent. So, Tatiana, um, let's let's look a, a bit more uh, at another region. Let's look at the question of Latin America. How how is COVID impacting Latin America? What are the main things you're seeing? So I think um, first of all, again, thank you for the invitation and thank you for for joining us. Um, Latin America is one of the hardest hit uh, regions in the global south at this moment uh, with COVID. We have more than two hundred thousand cases. Um, and more than 11,000 deaths. And that's underreported. We know that we have an inadequate te testing systems. That has been a struggle in, in the whole world. Again, in, in the global south, the access to testing at this moment is much more difficult and the capacity to purchase it is as well. Um, what we are seeing in Latin America is not only the high numbers, um, but there is a question on many of the governments have taken action and measures quite early on to prevent this virus, looking at what was happening in the US or Italy or Spain. And we still are seeing a, a huge spike. So there's a question on why, why do we see that happening? And the key factor is inequality and poverty. Um, if you look into how Latin American economy is built, it's quite easy to explain that when you have more than half of the population depending on informal economy, which means they depend on daily salaries. It's quite hard to maintain social isolation. People will leave their houses to try and get the work done for that day because without that money, they will starve. And there are already protests happening in the, in the region saying, well, we are not going to die from COVID. We are going to starve to death if we continue mm -hmm. not being able to, to work and with the governments not putting the social protection systems in place to support um, those, those families. On the other hand, Latin America has a very urban um, population and the, in the poorest neighborhoods and most, most vulnerable uh, places, it is a crowded setup of living. Mm -hmm. So social isolation is quite hard if you live in a small house with 10 people inside. And at least one of them has to leave every day to go and work mm -hmm. and go back into the houses. So um, the spread rates are quite um, high. And then there are the issues that Michelle mentioned as part of the global um, characteristics that is the poor access to water. And mm -hmm. if you don't have how to uh, clean your hands, you probably are not going to be able to um, prevent this. We saw, we are seeing hospitals that do not have access to water in Latin America. That, that's happening in Peru, it's happening in Honduras. And they don't have the capacity, therefore, to prevent even the, the health workers to, to get sick because they, the hospital themselves itself doesn't have <clears throat> sorry, proper access to water mm -hmm, to, mm -hmm. to do the cleaning. So we are seeing all of that on top of the previous humanitarian crisis that we had yep. already going on in the region. So Haiti has more than 5 million people suffering from hunger at, before the crisis. And with the crisis, that gets much more serious. Same for the dry corridor, the Northern Triangle in Central mm -hmm. America that was going through one of the hardest food security crises 
with 5 million people as well in the three countries, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, suffering from hunger, or the Venezuelan crisis that has inside of Venezuela and the numbers we have from Venezuela, unfortunately, uh, we cannot say we trust. Uh, but we had at least 7 million people inside of Venezuela in hunger. And then we have 5 million people that are living in very vulnerable conditions in the other countries. So we are seeing, for instance, uh, we saw people walking through Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru to leave Venezuela, to run away from, from poverty. We are seeing people trying to get back into the country because they lost their capacity to have an income. Um, so it, it is very complex when you have this kind of overlap of different crises in very vulnerable, vulnerable, vulnerable populations, right? So this is a little bit of how the situation is in, in Latin America at this moment. Okay, you've done an excellent job setting up the problem statement. And, you know, and, and there's a ton of stuff to be angry about here or to devote one's career to. If you were a doctor or a nurse concerned about immediate, um, immediate improvement in the situation, how do you tackle these things? I mean, here in the States as well, we've got health outcomes are totally related to income inequality to lack of housing, et cetera. But those are long-term fixes. What's, what's the short term, what's the medium term, what's the long term in the response? So I think one short term response is strong leadership to put in place the measures for uh, doing so, so, social isolation and preventing mm -hmm. the spread. That looks a bit differently in Latin America. A lot of that probably has to do with safety net programs um, you know, uh, conditional or unconditional cash transfers for the population so that they don't have to go out and work. And that's, mm -hmm. again, 53 to 60 percent of the population that mm -hmm. depends on daily salaries. Um, it is a short term response. It's needed because that's what will prevent mm -hmm. the overflowing of people for, for the, the health systems. Two organization, and I think we are seeing some very similar challenges between the U.S. and Latin America at this mm -hmm. moment on how to coordinate the response to make sure that hospitals are having access to the basic uh, equipment, either pro uh, protection equipment for the, the employees, but also um, the, the equipment, ventilators, UCI um, beds, and so on. With one difficulty that is extra, that is the capacity of governments to pur purchase that mm -hmm. in the current economic crisis is very yeah. complicated for Latin America. But there is still possibilities on if we have the debt um, relief, mm -hmm. for instance, that, it, that will empower. International cooperation will be key and is key. And I think that leadership on supporting countries in the, the global south yep. to be able to respond. Those are things that are more or less short term. And then mm -hmm. we need to, to look at. On the longer term, the strengthening of the health systems and the strengthening of community-based um, health solutions is important. We've learned from, for instance, from our response to Zika, that a lot of the information management, monitoring from cases and so on can happen at community level if they are resourced, educated, and trained to do so. And as we know that till we have vaccines, this will have to be managed throughout uh, public health systems and the community uh, management of it will be um, key. The other thing is, as we pass the initial uh, impact, how do we go back into the economic activities in a way that, is, that generates more equality than inequality in Latin America? And we'll need to, if we want to truly make a difference here, we will need to solve some of the historical issues. Um, those, those were always structural problems in Latin America. We are just learning how aggravated they can be. So I think that's a bit on, on the medium term, providing the economic mm. solution, supporting the agricultural um, producers so that food is arriving into the system, enhancing the local markets. Um, and I, I, I think that in, on longer term is about um, the higher structural issues that we face uh, forever in Latin America. So we are talking about corruption, we are talking about governance and transparency issues that will be for the longer term key to continue managing this crisis. Throughout the three of them, there is one thing that is fundamental, that is investing in women and girls and letting them lead yes. a part of this work. Um, because they are in the front lines, because they are the caregivers, 
because they are responsible for a lot of the informal economy and the care economy. When we talk about community health, we are talking about women and girls. When we talk about the health providers, we are talking about women and girls. And that's a key component in the short and in the longer term. Luciana, that was great. Thank you. A really helpful response. Um, something strikes me in listening to you. A, a lot of the problem statement setup that you gave, and even a lot of the solution setup, has to do with political processes. Um, now, CARE is I, it's an international federation, but it's also a US-based network. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and in any case, doing this is highly politicized across a range of countries. How does an organization like CARE, uh, if you like, protect its bona fides and its mandate to operate at the same time that it tries to address injustice? I think that we as CARE have different functions um, to, to, to be up to this crisis, right? We have and we are working on a very direct response in providing the basic humanitarian um, support and relief. Um, we know from making water available to food and, and so on. And there is a role to be played on the humanitarian space. Now, because of our history in the countries that we are at and in Latin America, we are at least for 50 or 60 years in the majority of the countries that we work, we have also built a very trust relationship mm -hmm. with the communities. Mm -hmm. And our role then is to support the local civil society on the governance processes. So it is about supporting uh, doing the, 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 the whole monitoring of governments and how civil society can um, fight for their rights and advocate for their mm -hmm. rights and advocate with their governments. Uh, there is a role of how can the, the local civil society be strengthened to be able to deal with further impacts in the future. And we do a lot of work uh, brokering those relationships between national and, and local governments with the civil society. So from very directly response supporting uh, women access the gender-based violence prevention services that are in place to helping women's organizations to ask for better services from, from the government. So I think there is this role of broker because of our trust between uh, in the government level and at community level that we need to play um, so, together with mm -hmm. local civil society. Great, great. Uh, uh, easily said and very difficult to do, but wonderful that you are doing it. Uh, a question for both of you. Um, you've both uh, gone through daunting challenges that that are there that emerge very quickly that need a rapid response and that need a complex and massive political slash economic solution afterwards so what gives you hope day to day you want to go first tati um i can so some some things that give me hope the strength of our teams in the field, we are talking in Latin America about Ecuadorians, Guatemalans, Honduran people that are fully committed in, in making a difference in their countries. And we are seeing amazing responses from people adapting to learn how to do um, their work via telework and attending Venezuelan population through the phone to people really um, available to go out and deliver the food that needs to be delivered for, for mm -hmm. populations in, in Haiti. So I think that's really inspiring, just the, uh, the fact that we have people willing to do that. And our, at the same level and in a similar way, the partners that we work with on the ground, that are day in, day, day out telling us, you know, we've, we've had partners from Guayaquil that you probably saw some of the news of the mm -hmm. very horrible situation. Mm. telling us, you know what, this this always happening. And if we don't keep doing what we do, this will be worse. Therefore, mm -hmm. here we are. And what mm -hmm. do you need, you need from us? How can you support us? How can we work together? That's what gives me hope, because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it will be the, the, on those hands that the transformation and the solution will come from. Um, even, you know, even when we get a vaccine, even when we get, 
at the end of the day, those are the people that will make things mm -hmm. possible. So that's what is giving me hope. And you're broadening our idea of who the heroes are, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, wonderful. Uh, how about you, Michelle? Well, all of those things that Tati said so well, I think I take um, great inspiration from the leadership of our team members around the world. And I, uh, have, I have over the last weeks been getting messages of solidarity and support uh, to the to I think our U.S. citizenry at large from my colleagues in West Bank and Gaza, from India, uh, around the world, wondering how we're doing here in the U.S. and uh, and then also um, I think for for both them and for us to recognize that uh, that we are experiencing some of the things that people around the world have experienced over and over again, whether that is. Uh, fragile health systems, uh, whether that is our own personal concerns about our health security, uh, whether that's interrupted education, uh, whether that's closed borders. Uh, there's a whole host of things that I think can give us all a sense of empathy and solidarity in new ways and that I hope that we can um, that mm -hmm. we can build upon. And often out of crisis comes extraordinary creativity and ingenuity. I see that in our own teams at CARE in Ecuador. They, within a few days, had managed a, a non-physical way of creating cash transfer through mm -hmm. a digital uh, partnership with the National Bank in Ecuador, where people could go directly through a text message to get ATM, uh, through a to an ATM machine. So there is, there is, um, an enormous reservoir, I think, of compassion and creativity that's being put to work. When I, again, talk to my colleague in India and think of all those scientists around the world who are fighting in some sense together, collectively, to, uh, to bring a, um, you know, to bring care and to bring also uh, ultimately a vaccine to this. Um, it, is, it is a reminder, I think, of, um, of our interdependence in the most powerful and profound way. And, uh, and I hope that we can, again, use it to, to rebuild, in some sense, um, more just and equitable systems. I, 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 I'm sure everyone on the call echoes that sentiment and has experienced a lot of the things, you know, um, that, that you've just gone through, uh, Michelle. Um, now you've both mentioned political leadership, and you know I think uh, there are a good number of countries in the globe where national leadership is turning away from global efforts, uh, and it hasn't necessarily facilitated or coordinated well their own domestic efforts on on on, on this crisis. Uh, one of I have a question from. Um, the, the Pacific Council CEO, Jerry Green, who is very keyed in, as, as are the other members of the Pacific Council, to the idea of non-state actors and their leadership, and particularly uh, in, in, in the case of, uh, of the states, individual states and cities. Um, you know, in, in the words of the mayor of LA, we're the most diverse city in human history. Uh, 40% of US uh, products come through our ports. Uh, we have 200 uh, ethnic groups here, uh, 200 languages spoken. Um, and yet we, do, we have not grown into our role as actors in global humanitarian efforts. Um, uh, can you tell us, and, and maybe I'd start with you, Tatiana, because what I've heard of the leadership in Sao Paulo is that it is very connected to global efforts uh, from your mayor on, from the mayor on down. Can you tell us a bit about the roles that cities can play and, and, um, and groups within cities in, in tackling things like this? And thanks for, for that question. Sao Paulo is my city and I have my family there. So I'm really concerned, but glad that we are having a, the leadership in, in the city and the state stepping up. I think there are some, some things that cities can play one in their national roles. I think we are seeing um, how a different leadership can, can respond differently that from, from the federal governments. And I, I think Brazil is a, a very clear case of how some cities are stepping up. But we are also seeing um, collaboration, again, in Brazil between cities um, in the same country. So you have um, they, they, the city and, uh, um, of Fortaleza in Ceará, 
supporting the response in Manaus, um, mm -hmm. which is a, a different city in the country. So there is some level of relationship there that can be strengthened and can provide um, capacity to, to respond. Even, even in, 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 in between or across countries, we are starting to see um, a collaboration being born between the, the um, uh, um, mayor of Quito and the mayor of Bogota to think about the strategies to deal with the Venezuelan population in both cities, in one in Ecuador and the other one in, in Colombia. And th th that's happening um, without um, a very productive engagement from the national governments from the, both countries. So there is a role because of, because the city, the municipality is the is the place where the problem happens at the end of the day. That's mm -hmm. the closest action that you have to response. There is a role to be played on sharing knowledge and sharing strategies that we are starting to see. And I think that's that can be very productive, right? Um, even in cooperation with other countries as well. Yeah, I would just add, I, I uh, was a part of a conference call, for instance, the Bloomberg team, the Bloomberg uh, Foundation mm -hmm. has been coordinating mayors from around the world and, mm -hmm. and using mm -hmm. shared resources for their response. And it's, you know, it's an extraordinary thing to see the mayor of Sierra, you know, it, a mayor mm -hmm. in Sierra Leone taking on also some of the same lessons as the mayor uh, in Ecuador, as a mayor who's living in Ecuador or the U.S., etc. Mm -hmm. So I think thinking globally at the same time that we're thinking locally is quite important. I, I would say that I do think one of the things that this does is reinforce for us, though, the important role of government, um, that there are as much vibrancy and dynamism and creativity as we have seen and will continue to see from civil society and local mm -hmm. uh, neighbors, helping neighbors is always at the heart of humanitarian response. But this does call out for us that failures in government, failures in investment of, in, in infrastructure and protective systems and safety nets does have enormous consequences. And ultimately, I'm in a state uh, of the state of Georgia where um, the governor is disagreeing with the president who's disagreeing with the local mayor, you know, to have mm -hmm. a um, a, a system that has very little coordination between mm -hmm. the dimensions of, of governmental leadership is, um, is, I think, both disconcerting and also, again, shows how important good governance actually is uh, and, um, and what a difference it does make. And just to, on a brighter note, I will say, and as, as, so, many, as so many have taken note, that it is interesting um, that some of the most remarkable national leadership has been led by women leaders. So whether it's mm -hmm. Taiwan or Germany or New Zealand, um, we do have models of governmental leadership that seems um, quite uh, inspiring and, um, and hopefully where, where there can be shared learning. Indeed. I, I actually wasn't going to uh, needle you about Georgia, so uh, I'm glad you brought it up because it's a, and we here in LA are used to four-dimensional chess, right, with a, a city of four million, a county of 10 million, a state of 40 million, and then the feds when they are there. Um, so I, I think it's, it's important not only to think of government as an actor, but to think of the different layers of government and how they need to act efficiently together. Now, I'd like to open up questions to, to the audience. Uh, so please use the chat function or the Q&A function. Uh, and I have one here from James Lee who asks, even if vaccines and treatments become available, how can they become readily available to developing world populations given that they're very expensive? An equity question. Do you want to take that first? Um, I can I can um, start and then I think it's one of the, the concerns because we are already seeing how the global competition for protection equipment or ventilators has been a challenge mm -hmm. for the access of, of, of um, developing countries. Uh, and we can see that happen with the vaccines as well. So, so hopefully we will be able to organize our global value chains before, <laughs> you know, fast enough for that to happen. Um, but there are ways and, and, and roads from um, international cooperation, again, cooperation between states from the north and from, from the south, um, enhancing the capacity of production at developing, in developing countries, and there is a role there for the national governments to, to be played on being able to produce the vaccines um, in the national countries. There is a choice on how this vaccine uh, will be or not protected by um, 
um, patents yeah. and so on that we need to look at, right? Um, and I, I think we have experience, for instance, with the HIV treatments and how mm. the countries that were able to, to break the patents are now being able to better treat patients. So that, there is a, a, a global dialogue about that. And then yep. the role, the role of the, the World Health Organization there is again key because that's part of the coordination mechanisms that we will need. So um, that, those are my initial thoughts. I don't know, Michelle, if you want to, to complement. I just would add that we can't let this, um, I think, uh, be um, distributed in, in a way that exacerbates uh, in, inequities, right? That ultimately this will be a question of social justice in terms of equitable distribution. And we happen to know that that already is a huge challenge as it relates to the medical mm -hmm. provision. So one of the things that I know that many of us think about is the number of people that die of malaria and TB and HIV and other uh, other diseases that that um, that we don't all turn our attention to in the kind of singular way uh, that we have with this pandemic, um, and it's it's I think it's important for us to think about um, how we might perhaps re uh, rededicate ourselves um, as it relates to sometimes the inequitable distribution of disease in ways that is mm -hmm. preventable. Um, and that uh, that we should um, that we should be both alarmed by and urgently addressing. Uh, and then I, I guess the other only other two things are that I do think that we have to recognize that just having the vaccine um, is is only a part of the mm -hmm. larger uh, conditions for success here, and that we have to start now um, de developing the distribution systems. It's one of the ways that uh, UN agencies, international uh, INGOs, local organizations need to be the ground troops um, readying for that vaccine, and that we rec that we need to also be considering how we continue the the prevention and preemption part, and um, and and sort of keeping the curve down while we give ourselves that time over months or years if required. Great, thank you. And I have another question from uh, Fahanas Kemali, who, who asks <laughs> if you can talk about the posture toward their foreign assistance portfolios during this time of COVID. For example, reserving of supplies and funds for domestic responses in the near term and any indications of what the pandemic will do to inhibit donors' willingness to engage in assistance in the longer term, related to global health, global health or otherwise. Peter, I missed the very first part of your question. Mm. Sorry. Well, basically, that uh, it, it appears that the U.S. and other donors are really focusing their resources on domestic response, and in some cases, countries are prohibiting the export of personal protective equipment. Uh, uh, so there's there's both a question about, uh, if you like, hoarding resources for oneself, both financially and, and materially, when, when the pandemic is global. Well, uh, yes, I think in, um, Tatiana po pointed to some of the, um, the issues that the United States has had as a way of thinking about this globally as well. If you look at uh, for instance, the war between the states for the provision of PPE or uh, the the ventilators, like that is a completely unhelpful um, mm -hmm. approach, right? And I think it's been pointed out. There is, of course, the governor in New York or the governor in New Jersey should be the steward of as much um, as much positive uh, supplies and support for their own citizens as possible, but they want to be a part of a coordinated effort. So they are not pitted against one another. And that mm -hmm. same thing needs to be true at a global level um, so that we are, um, again, in a spirit of shared humanity, um, really coordinating our efforts so that we can surge supplies where they are required versus hoarding them where they're not, but that we have a collective sensibility. The, the, the supply chains for PPE are global. And so, there, the, again, our interdependence around the supply chain demands a coordinated effort, in addition to it being the, the, um, the, you know, the humanitarian um, and moral thing to do. Well, so let Todd, me ask I you want to add to that. Yeah, I think the, the only thing I, I would like to add to that is um, the, the importance of also understanding that this is a crisis in which turning to 
your own country turning into inside will mm -hmm. not solve the problem. Because if, even if you were able to successfully completely eliminate the virus in one country, we've learned that this virus will come back as long as it exists in the globe. So it's not only about, it is about the global chain uh, being, we need, and the need of coordination, but it's also about the very logic thing that responding only in your country will not solve your problem. So you need truly to look outside of, of the, the borders and understand the crisis and collaborate globally. And that there's no other option on this one. That's mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. yeah, addition. Uh, uh, so, uh, that was deliberate that people set up supply chains that, that worked in optimal conditions and now they're realizing that, that we have no stockpiles in, around the world equitably or in our own countries. Do you think that there will be changes uh, in the future about how globally people try to provision things? Tatiana, why don't you take it? I missed the first part. I think I'm having internet challenges. So, I, right. I also missed the first part. Sorry, okay. so I think it was on, on Peter's sound. Clearly, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not being clear. Um, I ju it's, it's really a comment, I think. Uh, Michelle, you mentioned that uh, supply chains are global, but I think there is some rethinking now about whether supplies should, be, um, should not be stuck better in every place, um, because I think that's 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 something that we've we've come up with. Yeah. You know, I've got uh, one question here that uh, is almost as much to me as to the two of you, I think, about uh, funders, bilaterals, multilaterals, philanthropies. How are they seeing their role uh, now that they're being asked to fund both uh, in their own countries and globally? Uh, so you it's can definitely own. take that one, Peter. That's a good one for you. <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's not a difficult one for the Hilton Foundation since we've always worked both domestically and globally. And, you know, our initial responses were protect the homeless committee, community in LA and support WHO in supporting African Ministries of Health. But I think there is a question to every funder and every international NGO about where to invest the resources that we have when the problem is so much bigger than, than our resources. Uh, and I, I think, you know, the ways we're looking at that is make sure that we are doing real good for real people in real time. You know, that there, there was PPE for homeless people and, and ways to, to isolate when they don't have homes. But there were, that we're also investing broadly and ambitiously in, in things that could be game changing. There is, a, for example, a guarantee fund being set up for WHO procurement. That, that will try to, to um, lessen the risk on either side of default. And I think it's really important in, in the context that Tatiana brought up, that when, when countries don't have a lot of resources, they should be supported in getting the supplies that they need. Uh, that's way outside our comfort zone. It's not the sort of thing we would normally do at all. Funding, funding a regional office of a, of a UN organization is not the sort of thing we would normally do. But I think we're trying to think as global citizens and as, as was said before, as getting out in front of a next wave of this. If you, if you look back at 1918, the second wave of influenza was much more deadly than the first. And I think that's, that's relevant for the States, that's relevant for other places. I've got a plug for Brazil here from someone named D, who says that Brazil is making millions of coffee filters a coffee filter based PPE by German parent company Melita. Uh, and they're exploring how converting other Melita factories in the US and Brazil for mass production and in country distribution. So, uh, intriguing idea. Um, and then uh, a, a question from Rachel Cardone. Uh, after 2008, several uh, several bilateral agencies funding was constrained due to uh, austerity, despite considerable need. And even before COVID, there's considerable donor fatigue to the UN to address famine, et cetera, et cetera. Given the health crisis and the economic crisis, what are you hearing from colleagues in the funding community about funding commitments for 2020, 2021? You guys want to take that or 
pass it back to me. We will definitely want you on the hook for uh, for part of that question. Um, is, so, but I, I'll I'll take it a little bit. I mean, I think we're we are all enormously concerned about uh, about. Uh, donations, investments, and resources. And I think for big organizations like CARE, for small organizations, they're worried about their unrestricted dollars. They're worried about uh, their very ex you know, continued existence. Um, and on top of that, they're worried about whether we can come close to what is necessary and required to fight this, um, this, this pandemic in the, in the moment. The other thing I would add is I think there is a uh, great concern about what people are calling and people are calling different things, but um, sort of the second wave of pandemic. So whether that's, for instance, gender-based violence as a result of this, or whether that's interrupted education that has long-term consequences. Uh, there are a whole host of food nutrition security, which is already upon us, but maybe, uh, for instance, greatly exasperated. Imagine in Ethiopia, they're trying to deal with, our team is trying to deal with uh, the COVID response and also um, the threats uh, based upon locusts in, in, in East Africa. So uh, I, I worry about compassion fatigue and also, um, and not just from ordinary people, but from an institutional perspective and from a governmental perspective, are we thinking about this crisis, not only in the immediate sense, but as a marathon that we know that it will be as it relates to the kind of deep um, giving, I think that we're going to, and investments, because I think of it as investments as well, that we're going to need to be making um, as, as foundations, as governments, as individuals. Now my hook. Huh? Yeah, now the hook. <laughs> you, the, the person asked about 2020 and 2021. 2020, I think, is pretty clear. Foundations took uh, a, an initial 20% hit with the, the, the market dive in, in March, but I think most endowments are back up to a 10% hit. That is, their, their endowments are worth more than they were at the end of 2018. So foundations are not, as a species, in a bad situation, although the, the economy could certainly go through the floor more. Uh, and because of that, I have seen hundreds of foundations say to their grantees, uh, we will ease restrictions, we will make life easier for you, we know that you need to do other things than you signed up in your grant for, uh, and we will consider whether we should go above the 5% payout rule that keeps, that preserves our assets. Uh, I know that that in our own board is a, it's a, it's a strong debate, because there are those who are stewards of it and saying, let's not rub future grantees to pay today's grantees. And there are others saying we haven't seen a crisis like this, an economic one, for 100 years. My guess is that most foundations will exceed payout this year. But the thing to watch is next year, um, because we can't keep doing that and, and, and preserve our capital. Uh, and, you know, but I would say, too, foundations are, since they, their assets are linked to the stock market, they are doing better than the general population. And that means they should do more. Uh, we've got an interesting question here. Uh, how have perceptions of the US and China changed in developing countries over the course of this crisis? And that, that may be our last question. And then I'll ask you guys to give me some wrapping thoughts. Tati, you should take that one. So um, I'm not sure if I understood it. How the perceptions uh, from China and, and the US of China and the U.S., how have they changed in developing countries? The way people look at the U.S., the way people oh. look at um, it. It's interesting, um, and I think there is a, a mixed bag of of things there. Uh, because in one hand, you have the very xenophobic comments on this disease being born, created. Uh, you know, the fake news that China created this in a laboratory. All of that is spreading around. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the global south, but that goes hand in hand with also being the Chinese governments that are starting to step up on donations of protection equipment and ventilators to state. So there is this kind of uh, strange moment in which people are questioning themselves um, if, if they wanted to do this, then why they are helping us now and this perception, but there is a perception of China leading 
an area that was usually an area that was led by the US, especially for Latin America, there is this humanitarian efforts of supporting those countries. And on the other hand, I, I believe there is a perception of, there is a lot of surprise and, and, and I'm hearing from partners and, and, and um, people on the ground on how the US was hit by this crisis because there is this belief that the US functions, right? And everything's great and people, you know, they have the money to respond and New York is the, you know, most developed place you can think of in many of our countries and suddenly it's like, but if they are not being able to respond, what no. are we going to do about it, right? No. So I think it's an interesting uh, dimension to, to this crisis is seeing the perception of people um, towards the developed world. Mm. That's great. Uh, uh, this has been a fascinating conversation and I think really helpful to the membership of the, uh, of the Pacific Council. There are a few other questions that we will share with you offline because we don't have time to get into them. But really, thank you for, for these perspectives. And can I ask you each to give about a, a half minute takeaway message for people? Feel free to give homework. Uh, what, what are the most important things for people to think about and to do coming away from the conversation? I'll go first and then Tati, you have the last word. Uh, you know, 75 years ago, CARE was formed actually. So the first CARE packages went to post-World War II Europe. Um, this is a generational challenge and test much like that moment. And I think that America is in great danger of failing that test from a, a humanitarian leadership perspective mm -hmm. as a as a as a as a leader in the world um and uh and as a leader and in as you know in generosity as well and so i would just urge the members of the pacific council who are um who uh, who to you know to lift up your voices and to let's reshape this moment and ensure that we don't fail the generational test amen tatiana um, I would just compliment what Michelle said, saying, you know, there is a role to be played by every one of us in raising our voices and making sure that we understand that this crisis is a global crisis, that as hard as it is hitting the developed world, the way it hits the, the, world, the developing world, the global south, is much worse because of the structural problems. Um, so let's make sure that we are aware of what's happening out. It's, it's really easy to be so overwhelmed by what's happening in your neighborhood that you forget to look into what's happening at the rest of the world. Let's be very aware of the vulnerabilities of the rest of the world. Let's raise our voices to make sure that all governments and all people have the conditions to, to fight this. And let's make sure that we are in solidarity with one another cross borders, which is something that we are in deep need right now. All right, everyone, you heard it here. So uh, stand up for global solidarity and, and working together on this and make sure to look beyond our borders and be aware of what's going on everywhere. Uh, thank you very much for a really lively discussion. And Thomas, maybe I'll hand it back over to you to wind up. Thanks so much, Peter. Pleasure. Thank you. thank you all so much. That was incredibly interesting. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, we have a lot of activity coming up over the course of the next few weeks, and we hope you'll continue to join us. Uh, you can go to pacificcouncil.org uh, and click on our events page to see everything that we have coming up. Um, and if you are um, on this line and, and not currently a member, if you're a guest and would be interested in becoming a member, please reach out about signing up or uh, supporting the Council of the Donation if you are able. So thank you once again, and we look forward to seeing you all very soon.